So I'm 65 years old now and first began showing symptoms of BDD when I was 19. And at that point, I was a sophomore in college and began what I thought was losing a lot of hair. And that developed a lifelong obsession about, about losing hair. Now, an important element of all this is that that was 1973, I believe, which was, a, I think, about 16 years before BDD was a recognized diagnosis. Uh, and so I didn't think there was really any, anything psychiatric of nature going on. I just thought I was a 19-year-old with long hair, looked like any rock star of my generation, and didn't want to lose my hair. Uh, and so at that point, I developed a lot of compulsions associated with it. I stopped um, essentially combing my hair. I figured that if I just didn't, if I didn't comb it, I wouldn't have to see it fall out in the brush. Uh, and so I wound up with some very thick, curly, gnarly, uh, gnarly hair. Um, and frankly, and a, another compulsion for me was always reassurance seeking, uh, asking people um, who I was close to if they thought I was losing my hair. And of course, nobody ever said anything you know, of, of that sort um, to me. Uh, and so I did develop a lot of very strong compulsive, compulsive behaviors. But again, at that point, I had no idea that this was you know, evolving into a psychiatric illness. I just thought it was only normal for somebody 19 uh, to, to feel this way. And as these behaviors continued, I also got uh, more and more depressed. And so that, that has been a problem along with the, with the BDD focus. Uh, it, goes, it has gone hand in hand for me. Now, I'm talking about a lot of years ago now, and certainly things are very different for me. Um, I no longer experience the distress that I felt back then. Uh, but at that point, my life was very much consumed uh, with, uh, with these thoughts uh, and behaviors. Um, I will say that the behaviors did their job for a while. Um, as long as I was true to my compulsive behaviors, I seemed to, have, I seemed to be able to function pretty well. Um, as hard as it is to avoid your own hair, um, I seemed to do a pretty good job of it. Um, and so by, with all this avoidance, I was able to go to classes, I was able to do whatever I, I had to do. But there was one, one really big problem with this, and the problem it was that I always knew that if I lo really did lose my hair, I'd have to kill myself, uh, which obviously is a very sobering thought. And strikingly, it all made sense to me. Um, it all made sense that um, you know I could live ha as I was living back then, but if I truly lost my hair, my option would be suicide. Uh, and so again, it's pretty remarkable that I didn't really see it as a psychiatric problem then. Uh, I just thought it as saw it as really very you know something very normal. Well, the recovery process has been a a, a long. It's been a very long journey. Uh, when I first began showing symptoms. I didn't see um, I didn't see any therapists, uh, and it wasn't until I turned 30 uh, that things really changed dramatically for me. Uh, for some reason, the BDD became much stronger. I was getting much more depressed, and I did start seeing some therapists back then. Um, but the therapists I saw um, didn't know anything about what I was dealing with, and you know I would talk about my hair. And a response I remember once getting uh, was a therapist said to me, after listening to me for weeks, if not months on end, she said to me, look, I can't help you with your hair. What else do you want to talk about? And that was a very common reaction uh, that I got at the time. I took some medications. Uh, they didn't really help. Um, I took some of the anxiety drugs, and they just really served to knock me out. And I really wasn't, uh, I really wasn't doing well, although I had started the process, the process of therapy. Um, at the age of 40, uh, that's when my recovery truly started. And this was, of course, then 21 years after I first began showing symptoms of this. So I lived with it for a very long time. I was getting uh, very depressed a lot of the time. I don't know how I did it, but I still managed to work. Um, maybe part of the irony of all this is that I am a psychotherapist. And I, at the time, I was specializing in treating OCD. Even though I was living with BDD, I had never even heard of the term. Uh, but around the time that I had turned 40, I was already connected with the IOCDF, uh, which at the time, of course, was the Obsessive Compulsive Foundation when they were based in Connecticut. And I had uh, been getting their newsletter, and they had just started their, their operations at that point. 
A few years into it, I got this newsletter, and I think it was a cover article um, on body dysmorphic disorder and by Catherine Phillips. And I read it, and I just couldn't believe it. Uh, there was this description of this problem that I've had, I've had for about half my life up to that point, and it described me to a T. It described the obsessive thinking, it described the compulsive behavior, um, and the, the amount of torment that I was feeling. I had uh, actually begun to run some um, OCD groups at the time, and I knew that what I had was close to OCD, but it didn't seem like OCD to me. Um, I was in these groups, I was always the only person talking about a part of my physical appearance. And although I could relate to the obsessive thinking and compulsive behavior, I was the only one talking about a part of my body. And so when I saw this newsletter, I was just shocked. Uh, it was a tremendous relief just to know that there was a term for this, that it just wasn't something that I, that I was making up. So I, uh, Got the article, um, copied it at that point. It was pre-email. Um, so I made copies of it and sent it to members of my family around the country. And every one of them said the same thing, uh, that it described me to a T. Uh, and after that, I pursued therapy and I was seeing a psychiatrist. And he too didn't know really anything about BDD. But together, we, we learned about it. Uh, we learned about this illness um, together. And it was really at that point that I understood what I needed to do. I needed to be taking one of the SSRIs, and that, that was helpful for me. I also needed to be doing some, uh, some cognitive behavioral therapy, and that was hard to find back then, actually. I, I had a hard time finding people uh, who could treat me. Um, fortunately, I was very well connected at that point with the IOCDF and began attending their conferences. And I was learning a lot about BDD. And I, what I will say in terms of recovery, that's a really critical part of this. And what's helped me a lot is learning as much about this as I possibly can. Just the knowledge that this is a recognized psychiatric illness in and of itself can bring a lot of relief. Knowing that there's a reason that I'm thinking this way, there's a reason that I'm having these thoughts. It's not because I really wanna have these thoughts, it's because this illness is forcing me to, to have them. And so as I pursued this and as I pursued therapy, I, I did begin to, to get better. However, I think one of, the, one of the problems with many people with BDD, and I'm, I certainly was one of them, is that the beliefs connected to this uh, can be very, very strong. And even though people would tell me, uh, you know, I would do a lot of the cognitive therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, the exposure therapy, and do quite well, my beliefs were still very strong that, you know, again, I would have thoughts that, okay, I'm all I'm right now, but if I do lose my hair, then my option is suicide. Um, and so those, th those thoughts really, uh, really persisted. And so even though um, you know, I'm a therapist and I think at this point I probably know more about BDD than, than, most, people, than most people out there, it still at times um, can, get, can get the better of me. Um, and a couple of elements, I think, in terms of my, my own recovery that I especially want to mention, uh, besides learning as much about this as possible, one is the role of family. I have been blessed with a wonderful family, um, not just my own family now, I'm married with a daughter, uh, but, with fa but my own family. Um, they've been very supportive. They have never treated me you know, as if I you know, was somebody mentally Ill, mentally Ill. They just knew I had this problem and, and I needed to get help. Uh, they were never judgmental um, of me, and frankly, they never expected me either to live my life any differently in terms of their expectations about career and developing a life of my own. Uh, and they, they, they never stopped, they really never stopped believing in me. And so I think the support of family has been really a critical piece of this, uh, of this for me. Um, now, I realize not everybody is quite as fortunate as I am with, with that, and so I really do feel blessed to have had that support. Um, clearly, though, doing the cognitive behavioral therapy has always been a, a work in progress uh, for me. And for me, one of the things I had to be very careful with is with the, the mirror checking, is trying to get that behavior under control. Uh, I will say, and I think this is true for a lot of people with BDD, um, is that the mirror checking does cause a lot of distress. 
But one of the problems is that the mirror is also very seductive. Uh, and what I mean by that is that there are times if I do the checking, I can look in the mirror um, and feel like, all right, well, today's not so bad. Um, but that might be one out of 50 times, or it might be one out of 20 times, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is that if I do the checking, the greatest likelihood is that the BDD is going to win, and that I'm going to feel worse as a result, and that I'm going to feel the need to do even more checking. And so as hard as it is, what I've learned is to resist that behavior. Now granted, I need to do normal grooming. You know, I need to get up in the morning and shower. I need to comb my hair. And I do that. It's just that, you know, for the rest of the day, if I don't have to go to the mirror and comb my hair, I, I try not to do it. Uh, because I know, I know the potential danger I'm putting myself in. I'd much rather at this point feel the discomfort or feel the anxiety of wanting to check and really feeling the need to check and allowing that discomfort to be present and letting it just pass, uh, because it will pass. If I focus in on other things, focus in on my work, focus in on my family, or focus on exercise or something, that tension that I'm feeling will pass, and, and, that, and I have to let it do that. And that's what I mean when I say to people about, for myself, that I've learned not to feed the beast. Um, is by stepping away from, from these, kind of, these kind of behaviors. The same thing with, I, um, years ago, I kept many um, dermatologists in the San Francisco Bay Area quite busy. Um, I would go to them and ask them, you know, do you see my, can you notice my hair thinning? And every time I would go, they would say no. And then a couple of weeks later, maybe a month or two later, I'd think to myself, well, I went a couple of months ago. My hair's changed since then, so maybe I should go back again. And so I spent a lot of money um, with um, dermatologists. Fortunately, one, I went to a hair growth clinic one time, and the person said to me, oh, yeah, I can see your thinning. We can do something about it. All you have to do is give us about $10,000, and we'll fix it for you. Fortunately, I was smart enough back then not to do anything about it. Uh, but that clearly was a compulsion, and uh, a lot of people with BDD do engage in that stuff. And for me, it's just better to let the anxiety and the tension be present and not engage in the behaviors, and it will, it will, it will, it will subside over time if you, um, if you do let it. So I can't say enough about um, the, the role of CBT with this and the role, and the role of family. And another piece that I, I do want to mention is not waiting. What I've learned is not to wait for the BDD to go away for me to get on with my life. Uh, the BDD, I feel robbed me of about 20 years of my, 20 productive years of my life. And what I've learned is that I still need to do the things um, I want to do. Uh, I, whether it's career-wise, whether it's with family, whether it's recreational activities, hobbies, or whatever, um, I need to build my self-esteem in ways that go beyond BDD. Because I do believe if we do that, it weakens the BDD. I think for people who have BDD, a lot, so much of the focus is on you have to look a certain way before life feels worthwhile. And that's just not the way it is for most people. And I think if you build your life in a way that is good for you, where you feel worthwhile, you feel like you're having fun, you're enjoying yourself, you're feeling productive, that gives the BDD much less of an opportunity to cause you trouble.